Welcome this evening. I'm Judy Greenspan. I'm director of public programs here at the Center for Jewish History. And on behalf of the center, our partner organization, the Leo Beck Institute, and Oxford University Press, I'm very happy to welcome all of you tonight. So this evening's program with Professor Michael Nyberg is part of our series, Short Talks on Big Subjects. And I'm curious, with a show of hands, if you could show me how many people have been to one of these programs already. Nice, good. So you're collecting a nice library, I hope, of these books at home. Yeah, good. So for those of you who are new tonight, Short Talks on Big Subjects is produced here in partnership with Oxford University Press and features authors of their highly regarded, very short introduction book series. In a moment, Nancy Toff, Vice President and Executive Editor at Oxford, will say a few words about these short and hugely popular books that Oxford churns out on seemingly every topic imaginable. You can take a look inside of your book to see a list of the sorts of things that they write about. Um, when we started our series last January, there were 555 very short introductions. You are holding number 607 in your hands, and there are many more in the pipeline. So as you can imagine, these are deceptively slim volumes. It is not easy to condense big topics into small books or short talks, for that matter. And Professor Michael Nyberg brings years of experience to both challenges. His credentials are more completely listed in your program, but to mention a few highlights, Michael teaches history, strategy, and international relations at the US Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and is considered a foremost expert on World War I. Michael is the author of 12 books, and to share just one of his many accolades, when his book, Dance of the Furies, Europe and the Outbreak of World War I, was published in 2011, the Wall Street Journal called it one of the five best books ever written about that war. Tonight, Michael is looking back 100 years to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles and specifically to its impact on the course of Jewish history. So understanding how the past informs the present is, of course, central to our mission here at the Center for Jewish History. And before we begin, I'd like to say a few words about where you are tonight. And in our crowd tonight, is there anyone who has never been to the Center for Jewish History before this evening? Great. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm glad to see you. Um, to me, I consider the center a real, a rare treasure in the city of New York. It is a world-renowned research institute for scholars of Jewish history, a destination for public programs, concerts, exhibitions, a place to explore your family genealogy, and the center is home to our five partner organizations and their extraordinary archival collections. Our partners, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research together possess the largest repository of Jewish archival material outside of Israel. I think it's safe to say that most people walking by this unassuming building on West 16th Street that someone recently told me they thought was a post office have, have no idea that tucked away inside is an astonishing treasure trove of materials that span more than 500 years of history and include 50,000 digitized photographs, 500,000 books, and thousands of artworks, ritual objects, recordings, and film. So for example, relative to tonight's program, here is just a tiny taste of some of the artifacts that are preserved in this building and digitized for all to access in our online co collections. This is from our partners, the Leo Beck Institute. This is an actual photo album that is in their collection and digitized online. And you see some other pictures of people from that photo album. Uh, this is actual, uh, what is this, um, <laughs> World War I Austrian cav cavalry boots and medals that are in the archives. And this sketch is from a diary that was written by a man named Bernhard Bardock, who was a doctor during World War I, and he left uh, this diary. It is here in our collection. He's, he subsequently left Vienna 
and moved to the United States, moved to New York after Kristallnacht. So his life history is here in our archives as well. So as a historian, Michael has spent many, many hours researching in our collections, but I'd like to stress that the tremendous resources in this building are available to anyone who wants to come and look. Your, our online collections you can access from anywhere. You can come to our reading room and request materials, not necessarily those boots, but other sorts of materials. You can use our Genealogy Institute, attend our exhibitions and public programs. So if you are not yet on our mailing list, if we don't have your email, please leave it at when you leave this evening. Pick up our events calendar and program flyers in the lobby and we do hope you'll come back often and soon. Which brings us to tonight's program. Michael not only boiled down the Treaty of Versailles into this little book, but he is about to conquer this big subject in really under an hour. So we will have time for questions and answers at the conclusion of his short talk. We hope you'll join us for a reception and a book signing in the Great Hall when the program is over. We will begin in just a moment, but first let me introduce Nancy Toth of Oxford University Press. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. It's good to see so many familiar faces back again. Um, I know many of you have been here uh, in the past, so I'm going to dispense with my usual short history of the very short introductions and uh, just give you an updated box score uh, as to where we are. Uh, and that is also the last sports metaphor you will hear from me until the baseball VSI comes out in a few years. Um, so Mike's uh, Treaty of Versailles is number 607, which officially publishes this month. Uh, as of today, we're actually up to 612. Uh, they, they do come out rather frequently. Uh, 47 of those are now in second or third editions. We have another 232 signed, 504 more on the forward list. And there's another 25 suggestions that are circulating in-house for approval. So just to give you an idea of some uh, recent topics that you might not have seen yet, um, since, since we were last here in September, uh, we've published The Psychology of Music, Napoleon, this is in no order whatsoever, uh, Stoicism, Poverty, Autobiography, Tolstoy, Extinction, Physics, Synesthesia, American Foreign Relations, Secularism, and Chaucer. And people always ask, so I must answer this question, what topics have you rejected recently? So um, in, my, in my folder, in my email, we have Exercise Physiology, Bowling Broke, Behavior Sequence Analysis, Drones, Rights of Nature, social epistemology, video game music, punk, and ambiguity. You will not be seeing those soon in a bookstore near you. So one of my great um, opportunities and challenges is to find the right author for each topic. And when it came to the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and we did have some um, time uh, pressure because we wanted to make the centennial. Um, I thought about all the World War I books that I was working for, working on uh, for, prior to the centennial and all the books that I had consulted before that uh, to do my own research. And Mike Nyberg's name was at the top of that list. Uh, so after a not very good lunch at a military history conference in Arlington, Virginia, uh, he agreed to take on this topic. Um, now I will say that something that editors do is we drink bad coffee all over the United States. Um, and, and we did that in the interest of getting this book out. Um, but it was worth it. Um, so he has now given us just the right amount of information. Uh, there's some wonderful books out there that are just too big for some of us to uh, wade through. But even more importantly, he helped me understand how it was that the Treaty of Versailles set up so much of what happened in 20th century world history. And tonight, in less than an hour, he is going to do the same thing for you. Mike. 
Thank you all for coming. I want to start by thanking Nancy, who edited the book. I want to thank Judy for her unbelievable hospitality all through this process of getting this lecture set up. And I want to thank especially some friends and family who are here. And I want to thank this institution, which, as Judy said, I've done a lot of research in, uh, and I think is just a phenomenal, phenomenal place uh, to come visit. So if this is your first time, please make sure that you do come back. So it's my job tonight, with great people in the room at a great institution, to give a talk that is worthy of both. Let's see if I can pull that off and not screw it up. So what I want to do is focus on the Treaty of Versailles with a specific focus that's not in the book, but I do want to do because of the place that I'm speaking and where we are, and look specifically at the First World War and the Paris Peace Conference as a watershed in the history of Jewish life in Europe. We often think of the Second World War, of course. The history of the Jewish experience in the 20th century is overshadowed by that experience. It is also overshadowed, of course, by the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. But as I hope to show you here in under an hour, I promise, the First World War was no less consequential to Jewish history, and it was no less important or no less fundamental to those subsequent events in the 1930s and 1940s. One caveat. I am an historian of the First World War and of, the, of peacemaking much more than I am an historian of the history of the Jewish experience. So let me get that on the line right now. I want to introduce two sets of themes that I want to talk about here, and then we'll get right into the talk. The first set is to set the context of what happened during the First World War, predominantly in Eastern Europe. And there are really three themes to this first set. The first, and we'll talk about this a little more in a map I'll show you in just a bit, Although your image of the First World War might be of the famous Western Front with its static trenches and not very much movement, in Eastern Europe it is in fact very much a mobile war, with the war moving west, east, west, east across hundreds and even thousands of miles. And as I'll show you in just a minute, the part of Europe that these armies were running through and running over are precisely where the majority of European Jews lived. And this is going to cause tremendous devastation to communities that had been around for centuries. Second, the First World War does represent a massive break in European history. The, the phrase that most historians like myself use is chasm to describe the imperial identity of Europe in the years before the First World War, the ancient Austro-Hungarian, German, Ottoman, and Russian empires they will be replaced by the end of the First World War with the new nation state system. And I want to just underscore as a First World War historian how fundamental this shift is. These had, were empires that had been around for centuries. These are empires that were not just political institutions, they were social institutions, cultural institutions, even economic institutions. When the First World War began in the summer of 1914, nobody except one person that I can find, Frederick Engels, and he was dead by the time the war started, nobody thought that one of these empires was going to go away. Instead, within four years, all four of them had gone away. This is a massive shift in the nature of European society. It's why some historians believe that the First World War doesn't really end until 1945, when it's determined what the shape of Europe will look like, there are even some historians who would argue that the First World War doesn't end in Europe until 1989, when the Soviet Union, itself a product of the First World War, finally goes away. And to transition to the third bullet, I have colleagues at the Army War College who call the wars in the Middle East today the wars of the Ottoman succession. In other words, we're still trying to figure out what political system is going to govern the Middle East in the wake of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And that's the third uh, big wartime theme. When the First World War began, nobody in Great Britain had set the destruction of the Ottoman Empire as a political goal for the British. They actually wanted the Ottoman Empire to remain in place, largely as a check against their own ally, the Russians. And as some of you know from your study of the First World War, the Gallipoli campaign in 1915, the brutal treatment uh, by Ottoman soldiers of British soldiers in the Kut al-Amara campaign in Mesopotamia, the Arab revolt made famous by the movie Lawrence of Arabia, all of that shifts British thinking from thinking that the Ottoman Empire ought to remain to a belief that the Ottoman Empire should just be blown up. And I'll show how this works in just a bit. The main result of this, as far as uh, the Middle East is concerned, is that Great Britain will take over control for large parts of the Middle East, including the Ottoman province of Palestine, a place that didn't even have really highly identified borders at this time. <clears throat> 
The image that I've shown you here is Jewish soldiers in the German army at Hanukkah in 1916. And I want to highlight that Jews are an unusual group in that they serve in every army in Europe. Assimilated Jews in the British, French, German, Italian armies, somewhat less assimilated perhaps in the Russian army. What this means is that Jews can be seen as an enemy by almost any state in Europe because there are Jewish soldiers fighting across the border. The Poles kind of have this problem too, but as I'll show you in a bit, they're going to work it out a little bit differently. In 1916, there is a very famous incident known as the Jew census in 1916 when there are accusations from German conservatives that Jews are not serving in their proper number. They're serving under uh, proportion. So the German army actually does a census. It does a count. And they find, much to the surprise of the people who ordered the census, that Jews are in fact serving above their proportion in the population. So the German army decided not to release the report, which of course only fuels the belief in the post-war years that the report was onto something. And something like this is going to happen in almost every army in the First World War. One more bullet slide, and then I promise more interesting things to come. For Jewish communities, these are three shifts that are either brand new in Jewish history or they are massive accelerations of processes that had already been underway. The first and the one that I'm going to focus on probably the most in this talk is a shift for Jews from an imperial identity to a national identity. This is a problem across Europe. So whereas before 1914, if you lived inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it didn't much matter whether you identified yourself as Polish or Italian or Czech, what mattered was you were a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. A big shift at the end of the First World War is that with the end of these empires, these new nation states of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, either get created or reimagined. And that's going to be a really problematic issue for the Jews of Europe. Second, the question of Palestine. It's kind of remarkable to me when I do research on the two world wars, how late Palestine emerges as an obvious solution for Jews that can't stay in their home communities in Europe. It's really not until the mid-1940s, 1942, 43, that this becomes a real topic of discussion among American Jews especially. But it's 1917, as I'll show you in a bit, when the British Army comes through Palestine, taking it away from the Ottomans and opening up at least the possibility of using Palestine as a place for European Jews to go. And then third, and probably most damningly for what happens in the 1930s, the association of Jews with this new terrifying ideology of Bolshevism or communism, which is a transnational movement crossing borders. And I want to talk about all of those. All three of those patterns coming together lead to a new round of pogroms after the First World War. This image here are Jewish victims of a pogrom in the Ukraine in 1919. And these pogroms are happening all over Europe. This is a map of Europe when the First World War began. Uh, it shows the alliance system, which is really not relevant to what I want to uh, talk to you about here. But it certainly shows the four big empires that governed everything kind of east of the Rhine River. The multi-ethnic German Empire, which had Alsatians, Jews, Danes, and Poles. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, whose officers were required to give commands in nine different languages. That's how polyglot the empire was. The Russian Empire and, of course, the Ottoman Empire, which this map doesn't show terribly well, but stretched all the way down into what we now call Iraq, Syria, and into Arabia. Jewish life in these empires, with the probable exception of the Russian, was not necessarily terribly bad. If your families are at all like mine, they left Russia because of this. Many other Jews living in the German, Ottoman, and Austro-Hungarian empires could report that while life wasn't great, it wasn't terrible either. If you're familiar with the novels of Joseph Roth, the Viennese writer who talked about how much he loved the Ottoman Empire's diversity, Sigmund Freud, whose writings in the summer of 1914 talk about the need to keep the tolerant, diverse, open uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire alive, the sense of assimilation that men like Freud could experience in Austria, and the high ranks that some Jews could get to in the Austro-Hungarian and in the German armies. The Austro-Hungarian was the only army in Europe that had large numbers of Jews in the senior levels of the officer corps. The war, as I said, is going to very quickly and very suddenly blow this system up. Just to take Austria-Hungary as one case study, the emperor of Austria-Hungary, the aging Franz Joseph, had been on the throne since 1848. He was the third longest serving monarch in European history. All of these empires had been around since at least the 16th century. This was an old, ancient way of governing Europe. 
This is the map I talked to you a little bit about earlier. The areas that I put in these kind of shaded squares, power parallelograms, whatever they are, these are the areas of heaviest fighting on the Eastern Front from 1914 to 1916. And you can see here, the purple and blue areas are areas where 10 to 15% or more of the population is Jewish. So these are places where armies are running over left and right, east and west as they go. All of those black dots that you see there are cities that are at least 30% Jewish in population. And although it seems odd to our mind and our imagination and the way we think about this period, for most Jews, they were hoping for the success early on of the German and Austro-Hungarian armies in order to liberate Jewish life in the East from the Russians. What quickly becomes apparent, however, is that armies moving over your land, be they German, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, Ottoman, are really interested in only one thing, and that is taking whatever food and whatever goods you happen to have sitting around. There's a big debate among historians about whether German policy in Eastern Europe in World War I does or does not foreshadow what the Germans would do in the Second World War. That's not a debate that I really want to get into here. The point is, as Jews saw German soldiers coming onto their land, they didn't get quite what they expected. No matter what army it was that crossed over Jewish lines, the problems were the same. In 1915 alone, an estimated 77,000 Jewish refugees arrived in Vienna, 25,000 more in Budapest, 15,000 more in Prague. These are people leaving traditional Jewish communities that are devastated by the First World War, and these are people whom the Germans would have referred to as Ostjuden, Eastern Jews, most of them Orthodox, Yiddish-speaking, and not well assimilated. They look different, they act different than the Jews who are already existing in these cities and they produce a strong backlash, especially in Vienna, where authorities tried to do everything they could to get these Jews out of the city as quickly as they could. Most of these Jews are living on charity provided by Americans, largely from the Joint Distribution Committee, or the, just the AKA the Joint, and after April 1917, when the United States came into the war, that money stopped. So the condition of Jews in Eastern Europe is really quite bad. What to do about this in the post-war world? Well, you all should know, I hope you all know, the American President Woodrow Wilson had come up with a plan. He came up with his so-called 14 points that one of his advisors wrote in a private letter that I, I read here in New York City up at Columbia. He said, the President has given us nothing but vague phrases and beautiful ideas. Nothing you can really build a future on. And here are two of those points. One reads, that this is point 10, the people of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured, should be accorded the freest opportunity to autonomous development. That's a vague phrase and a beautiful idea. I'm going to show you how hard this is to do in just a minute. And point 13 reads, an independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations. How do you do this? It is one of the most American documents I've ever seen in its idealism and in its vision for remaking the world. The French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, when he saw the 14 points, said God himself was content to give us just 10, which is a great line. Woodrow Wilson never used the phrase national self-determination in the 14 points. It's a phrase that comes from the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, but Wilson understood the idea. What he wanted to do was find places that are indisputably Polish, whatever that means, draw lines around them, and create new nation states around them. And there are wonderful descriptions of his advisors sitting with him on the floor of the Hotel Creole in Paris, literally drawing with crayon ideas about where borders ought to go. This is a time period when the United States had very few area experts, very few people who actually understood what these parts of the world look like. Moreover, if you're going to create a nation state, you have to start asking yourself questions. What is a nation? Who gets to be one? Wilson had already determined before he left for the Paris Peace Conference that the Irish did not qualify because they were properly represented through the British Empire and that the Jews did not qualify. Now, this was not a subject that I think Woodrow Wilson spent a lot of time thinking about, but it was also a debate that American Jews and European Jews also had. Did the Jews constitute a nation, the strict definition by Zionism, or did they constitute a religion? If they constituted a nation, as the Zionists believed, then they should have their own piece of ground to call theirs. If, on the other hand, the Jews were a religion, all they should need was the right to raise their children, practice their religion in the way they wanted inside these new nation states. 
So again, there's no easy definition about what a nation ought to look like, who ought to be in it, or even if the Jews uh, were, in fact, a nation. So how to translate this Wilsonian rhetoric into action, and what would it mean once you redesigned these nation states for the minority peoples that would inevitably live, be living inside? Nobody in 1919, except the Greeks and the Turks, envisioned physically moving people out of their homes. The idea was to draw the best lines that you possibly could and hope that the rest would work itself through. But the key question remained, what they would have called in 1919 the nationalities question. How do you protect the rights of minorities who will be living in these new nation states? And if you're an assimilated Jew living in the United States, Great Britain, or France, how do you advocate for the Jews of another nation without it seeming to be calling your own patriotism into question? These are real problems that American Jews and European Jews are starting to think about. Well, what Wilson did is very interesting. Wilson did not believe that his own State Department could do this. He figured that they were too um, uninformed, and once they got in front of these really good British and French diplomats, they would just get run around. They would just not know what they were doing. So he did something really interesting. No president's ever done it since, and it's probably a good idea. He said, in lieu of diplomats, I'm going to create a board of academics, and they're going to figure it out for me. So in October 1917, well before anybody knows if the United States is even going to win this war, he made a phone call to Massachusetts, to a place called Magnolia, Massachusetts, and to his advisor, Edward House, and he said, get me a group of academics who are not experts in this, who can be unbiased, and get me some data. We're going to handle this the way progressives handle problems. Get me data. Edward House had no real idea how he was going to do this, so we started calling some Ivy League professors. It's actually the first place they meet is here at the New York Public Library. Later, they meet at Columbia University. Eventually, they set up shop in Washington. The group calls itself the Inquiry. In 1921, they reformed themselves as the Council on Foreign Relations. So they consider themselves the first academic think tank. And the idea is to just amass evidence. Just get us data so we can figure out what is going on. Most of the maps I'm going to show you, or at least the first couple maps I'm going to show you, are at Yale University in their archives. And to me, they're really, really fascinating. Who lives inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Now, it may not come as a surprise to you that the Austro-Hungarian Empire never thought it was important to differentiate who was Polish, who was Romanian, who was Czech. It didn't matter to them. They're all subjects of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that's what they're going to stay for all eternity. So the inquiry started looking for data. Who lives here? Well, this is what they figured out. One way we'll figure out how to define nationality is by figuring out what language people primarily speak. Ready? This is the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a linguistic map. <laughs> this is what it looks like. And it's actually beautiful. It's hand-drawn. You can see, maybe not so much on the PowerPoint here, but there are shades of color to show what language people speak and the intensity with which they're represented. Then the inquiry took a look at this map and said, well, wait a minute. If we do this, if we define national self-determination by language and we start drawing borders that way, we're going to end up creating states that are too poor to feed themselves, and we may end up creating states that are too small or too op have too much open border to be able to defend themselves. So we may end up having to put people in states we don't want to put them in for the greater economic or military good of the state. Anybody ready to start drawing lines? It's a really complicated procedure that they're trying to do. So the inquiry goes back. Well, we need economic data. There are maps of potash production, where canals go, where mountains are, everything to try to figure out where these nation states should best be drawn. Two things I want to put in front of you right now. The first is, these decisions are to be made based on data, not on history, and not on the justice of the claim of the people involved. That's a key point of the inquiry, which to me is really interesting. There are lots of historians working on the inquiry. Almost none of them are asked to give an historical opinion of their problem at hand. It's fascinating to me. The inquiry also, just as uh, on the off-site, on the off uh, uh, point here, 12% of the inquiry studies are on Latin America. So they're thinking of reshaping the entire world, not just the world as impacted by the First World War. The second thing is that for Jews in particular, this is a big problem. None of these colors is for Yiddish or Hebrew or any language that Jews might have spoken at home. What to do with a Jew who had fled from Russian Poland 
and came to Vienna. Where do they go in the post-war world? Do they go to Russia? Do they go to Poland? Or do they stay in Vienna? And no one really has the answer to it. I saw this in Paris this summer when I was there, this fall when I was there. This is a fascinating two maps. Now, other countries, of course, know that the United States is doing this. So here are two maps presented on who lives in Romania. Anybody want to guess which one is the Romanian map of who lives in Romania? That's the one on the right. The one on the left is what Hungary thinks is where Romanians live. Both of these maps represent multiple ethnic groups. None of them counts Jews. What do you do with them? What can you do with them? Well, as, pro as most of you probably know, one thing that came out of the Paris Peace Conference is this new map of Europe, this strange, bizarre jigsaw puzzle that the great powers came up with. These are all nation states that are designed to be some combination of national self-determination, economic self-sustain, self and capability to defend themselves, which means you get these bizarre maps. And you get maps with places where they know there are going to be large numbers of non-national people inside the borders. So the problem again becomes, how do you solve this problem? How do you define what the new nation is? The people that are creating these new nations in 1919 love to go back to ancient imagery. They wanted to show a long-term connection between the people and the land. What that meant was that most of the imagery was rural. Most of the imagery was about this long, long attachment from, say, Poles to the Polish soil. Other things like language, culture, food, literature, religion, education, all become markers of identity. And you can probably already see where this is going. If you're a Jew living in Poland, you are by definition an outsider to this new nation state system. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that your life in these countries is going to necessarily be bad, but it means that the markers of identification, the markers of identity, don't fit you. So what do you do? How do you protect these nation states? How do you protect the rights of the nationalities inside them? There are two theories that are floating around in 1919, and they're both pretty interesting. One is what's called the brother state concept. The idea is to take the Romanian-Hungarian example. If Hungarians in Romania are being mistreated, then Hungary can go before the League of Nations and make a claim on their behalf. This is the brother state theory, that every ethnic minority will have a bigger state that can represent them in the League of Nations. You can already see where this is going. Second is the concept called reciprocity. And the idea is that the Romanians will have to treat ethnic Hungarians well because they're going to expect Hungary to treat ethnic Romanians well. One of these two things ought to protect national minorities. Everybody see where this is going? The Jews have no brother state to protect them. And they have no state to issue reciprocity on their behalf. It's possible that the United States or Great Britain could have stepped up and said, we'll act as the brother state for minority groups. Neither state, of course, was terribly interested in doing that. There was also a theory that you could take the League of Nations and you could give each minority group representation so that the Jews would have a voice in the League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson didn't want to do that either, mostly for fear that African Americans would request the same right as ethnic minority inside the United States. So what's the answer? The answer becomes that every state that is created in this system in 1919 is required to put into their constitutions a clause that says that minority groups will have the right to educate their children as they wish and to practice their religion as they wish. Wilson, being an American, you put it in the Constitution, it's there, you're good, problem solved. And that's largely what he did. There was also the argument, mostly advanced in Italy and France, that the best thing to do with minority groups is to force them to assimilate take away their minority privileges so that they'll become more like Italians, Frenchmen, Romanians, whatever. In Germany's case, this reshuffling of the map took away almost all of Germany's Poles, Danes, and Alsatians, meaning that the only large minority group left were Germany's Jews, ironically a very assimilated group already. The end of the Russian Empire is probably the most important, and I want to show you a document that I saw here. It's upstairs in the archives. This is the diary of Rabbi Samuel Price, who was in uh, Newark, New Jersey, and then went to Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and this is for a long time in his diary. 
he didn't mention the First World War at all. There's a lot of discussion in 1916, and then it sort of fades away and he doesn't talk about it. He moves on to other things. On the day that Tsar Nicholas II, the most wicked anti-Semite in Europe, withdrew, that is, abdicated his throne, this is what Samuel Price wrote in his diary, freedom for Jews. And a group of Cincinnati rabbis was so ecstatic by the end of the anti-Semitic Romanov Empire that it proposed adding a new day to the Jewish high holidays to mark this occasion. It's enormously important. It's only after the abdication of the Tsar, remember March 1917, that Woodrow Wilson can use the phrase, a war to make the world safe for democracy. Until then, it's impossible to do, although World War II shows that you actually can do it. He didn't want to do it. It's the event that helped the United States bring, come, come into the war as a war to make the, the world safe for democracy. It is an event that forced Germany to take a very risky offensive on the Western Front in 1918 to try to win the war before the Americans could get there. And it also means this brand new future for Jews. If this works, if the new Russian government accepts minority rights for Jews, then most of the problem should go away. And for a couple of months, it looks like this is what's going to happen. Russia is governed by a, a, a government, a provisional government, run by a man named Alexander Kerensky. And just to give you an idea that this wasn't that long ago, my dissertation advisor had lunch with Alexander Kerensky at Stanford in the 1960s. It really wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things. The problem, of course, is that that provisional government doesn't last, and it is replaced by the Bolshevik government of Vladimir Lenin in the fall of 1917. Again, the first revolution brings a lot of hope. The second one brings a lot less hope. There is a strong association in Europe of Jews with this radical second phase of the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik phase of the Russian Revolution, to produce propaganda like this one. And again, I want to stress this is not just a problem inside Europe. That's what the second quotation on this slide is designed to show you. The problem is both in Europe and it's in the United States. This the bottom quotation is from an Arkansas millionaire named George Armstrong who published his own newspaper, today he would have done it as a blog I'm sure, called The Cross and the Flag. He said that 80% of Europe's Jews were communist, thus he bragged, I am 80% anti-Semitic. Now, of course, this is building on old Jewish stereotypes, old stereotypes of Jews as outsiders, as aliens, as controlling international finance. In this particular weird case, it is arguing that Jews are both controlling the capitalist system and the Bolshevik system. But these images that you see here further ostracize, further alienate Jews in ways that are going to have really murderous implications in the 1930s and in the 1940s. And again, it's not just in the countries that we think of. In 1936, the French prime minister, the Jewish Leon Blum, was dragged from his car and nearly beaten to death. There's an exhibit out here and to the right on the restrictions on US immigration in 1921 and 1924 that for all intents and purposes closed the United States off to Jewish migration from Europe in the 1920s. And I would encourage you to go out and see those political cartoons that are there. The United States government did not change those laws in the 1930s or even in the 1940s and did not change them even when it knew the full extent of the horrors of the concentration camps. And much to my own home institution's shame, the United States Army, in 1945, the United States Army, 1945, the United States Army wrote a report arguing that one out of every three Jews in Eastern Europe was a Bolshevik. Therefore, in the 1946 immigration debate, it was the Army that made the strongest argument for keeping the 1921 and 1924 limits in place. So this connection goes back a long way. And you can see here the image of the Jew holding a map of Europe with a hammer and sickle over it. Complicated enough yet? It gets worse. As I told you, in 1916, the British had come to the conclusion that the Ottoman Empire had to go away. What do you do with it is the question. In the spring of 1916, an a British diplomat and a French diplomat, Georges Picot and Mark Sykes, sat down and drew this. They carved the former Ottoman Empire into five zones. The area that is in blue will go to the French Empire. The area that is in pink, which is roughly today's Iraq, will go to the British Empire. The area that's in A, which is roughly today's Syria, will be under France's protection until France decides it can be its own state. The area in B is roughly, of course, what translates today to Jordan. And Britain will do the same thing for Jordan that the French will do for Syria. This is the map, the so-called Sykes-Picot map, that ISIS takes 
as the touchstone of much of their ideology. When they take over a territory in Syria that lies on this line, they have a big ceremony with bulldozers and they literally bulldoze over the Sykes-Picot lines. And as you can see here, there is a little yellow corner right there called Palestine, which roughly corresponds to what we think of today as Israel minus the Negev Desert. And there is a little piece here at the oil refinery port city of Haifa that the British, of course, keep for themselves. This is a secret agreement. The United States did not know about it until the Bolsheviks found a copy in the Russian state archives and released it, infuriating Woodrow Wilson that the British and French would do this without telling anybody. And there is, of course, the other problem that Britain and France had made this agreement before they actually controlled any of this territory. So they've got to take it before they can decide what they want to do with it. The Ottomans, meanwhile, started forcibly moving Jews out of cities like Haifa, Jaffa, Jerusalem, and what was then becoming the, the city of Tel Aviv, probably dropping the Jewish population of Palestine by about one third in the process. What then do you do in the post-war period? Should the Jews be compensated for their loss of this territory and loss of land? And should the United States back the Sykes-Picot Agreement or should it walk away from it? It's gonna get more complicated still, I promise. The United States was very, very wary of getting involved in the Middle East. The key for the United States is not actually Palestine, it's up here in Armenia, where Americans had really criticized the British and French for not doing enough to protect the Armenians, who about a million Armenians die during the First World War. So in the post-war period, the British and French go to the United States and say, well, if you don't like the way we did this, we'll carve out this area up here, and that can be yours. We'll call it Area C. And Woodrow Wilson, of course, wanted nothing to do with it. Although there was a debate about sending Ameri the American military into Syria. Complicated enough yet? Let's make it more complicated. November 1917, this man, Arthur Balfour, released the Balfour Declaration, which read, His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Notice he did not use the word state. And will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. That last bit is designed to protect Jews living in Britain to support this idea without them coming under scrutiny, without them being told that they should go to Palestine as well. Now what do you want to do? There's another set of documents called the Hussein McMahon Agreement by which the British government promised to give everything more or less in A, B, C, red, blue, and yellow to the Arabs under a wider federation led by the Emir Faisal, who you'll know from the movie T.E. Lawrence, you'll know from Lawrence of Arabia. And there are American advisors to Woodrow Wilson who think that's exactly what the United States ought to do. Some of you may know, if you go to Israel, it's a fun thing I think to do. That's the Jaffa Gate right there. If you want to, you can walk right through it, as that man did. This is the British General Edmund the Bloody Bull Allenby, who shortly after his own son was killed on the Western Front, and shortly after he had screwed up an offensive on the Western Front, is called into the British Prime Minister's office. He thinks he's going to get fired. And the British Prime Minister says to him instead, what military resources do you need to conquer Palestine before the end of the year? Allenby tells him, I think I need four divisions of troops. I need this artillery. I need this. I need that. David Lloyd George says, OK, it's yours. And some of you may know the story. In the 19th century, the Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm II, had had part of the Jaffa Gate blown up so that he could ride in on a white charger. Allenby very famously wore, as you can see here, no weapons and walked through the Jaffa Gate in a sign of humility to the city of Jerusalem. And again, the image doesn't really show it here, but if you could see this image up close, you can see this wide variety of kinds of people who are there to welcome him, Jews, Muslims, Christians, all kinds of people. He then went to the so-called Tower of David, which is not very far from where this photograph is taken, and delivered a speech declaring that 1,300 years of Mohammedan rule over Palestine was done, and that Palestine now belonged to Great Britain. Now what do you want to do? And what should the United States do? Apologies for the bad quality of this map. Uh, this came from the Library of Congress's exhibit. If you're in DC, in the near future, the Library of Congress has a beautiful First World War exhibit that's on for a little while still, a little while longer still, that I uh, was lucky enough to advise on. They've been rotating documents through, and this is one of the documents that they came up with. This is an American idea for what you might do. This would be the new state of Turkey. This would be internationalized. This would be Armenia. This would be British influence. 
And then, and I apologize again that the quality is so bad, it does say Jewish state right here. And it does use the word state. Now, it appears from the documents that what the Americans actually had in mind was to make this a British colony, a Jewish colony inside the British Empire, rather than to actually make it a state. The point I want to make is the wide variety of ideas that were on the table. And one of the things that's really interesting to me as an historian is to think about what we historians call moments of contingency, moments when they might have decided to go ahead and do something different. And they're thinking about it. A wide range of options is on the table. Um, and just to give you an idea of how crazy this is, to me as an historian, how insane this is, this is the city of Istanbul, Constantinople, up here. The American who's involved in this process, when he's called by the inquiry in the fall of 1917, he's a man by the name of William Westerman. He's an expert in reading Egyptian papyrus scrolls at the University of Wisconsin. Two years later, he's in the meeting where they're deciding what they're going to do with Istanbul. That's crazy. That's crazy. But that's what they're doing. Now what do you want to do? Well, believe it or not, a lot of British and American Jews didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to bring this issue up at all. Again, for fear, as the Balfour Declaration also recognized, that if they press for a Jewish state too much, they might get calls to move back to Israel themselves. They might be told, well, if you're supporting this idea, you can't be a good American or a good Frenchman or a good Briton, a problem that continues. A few years ago, Benjamin Netanyahu spoke to a group of French Jews and encouraged them to move back to Israel because of the anti-Semitism in France. Those French Jews responded by singing the Marseillaise to him. Not, I think, what he was expecting to hear. So there are Jews, of course, that serve in the American, British, and French armies. The British created this thing called the Special Jewish Unit. The historians who have studied this unit argue they wanted to fight for Great Britain. They did not believe they were fighting for the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine or anywhere else. And few of its veterans moved to Palestine after the war. This, this, the, the chief historian of this unit argues that only three Jews moved to Palestine after the war. My favorite's the one on the right. This is an American one from the Jewish Welfare Board. Uh, my Yiddish is not very good, but it says, don't worry, he's all right, with the final word all right written in the English all right, transliterated with Yiddish characters, which I find just beautiful, taking an American idiom, and then the image of the much more orthodox, much more Ostjuden looking to parents, and the very American looking, undistinguishable from other Americans, their son who's got his arms on them. And of course, one of the things that makes him indistinguishable from other Americans is that he's wearing the same uniform as any other American soldier would be wearing. This is the issue for most American and most British Jews. The answer in the United States and Great Britain is assimilation. It is the idea of becoming Jewish, of course, keeping a Jewish identity, but assimilating, acculturating into the wider society. There's that great joke about what Zionism means to an American, that it means that it's one Jew paying a second Jew so a third Jew can move to Palestine. It doesn't mean that American Jews, British Jews, French Jews want to move. A key distinction between what's going on in the assimilated West with what's happening in the East. And as I mentioned, Palestine's not really a part of this discussion until the 1940s, actually until a meeting in 1942 right here in Midtown New York City uh, at the old Biltmore Hotel, but that's for another lecture. This is what the British and French eventually come up with. A South African by the name of Jan Smuts came up with this idea, that what you would do would be to create Syria, which is mostly Muslim, Lebanon, which is mostly Christian, Iraq, crazy enough, which is part Shia, part Sunni, part Kurd, and of course had a lot of Jews living there in the 1920s. You would create a thing called Transjordan, and then you would create a thing called Palestine. They would not be parts of the empire, and they would not be independent nation states. They would be called mandates. And the idea was that Britain and France would govern them in the name of the international community until such time as that international community decided they were ready for self-government. Who gets to decide when they're ready for self-government? The British and French. So you can sort of see where this is going. Early on in the Paris Peace Conference, David Lloyd George and Georges Clemenceau, the, the prime ministers of France and Britain respectively, were having a discussion about the Middle East. Clemenceau said to Lloyd George, what is it you really want in the Middle East? Lloyd George said, we want Palestine. And Clemenceau said, then you shall have it. Clemenceau himself was not an imperialist. I think he would have been happy not to take Syria or Lebanon either. So Palestine became the British mandate of Palestine. The United States refused to play the game, refused to take on Armenia, refused to take on any role in Palestine. And of course, the United States didn't even sign the Treaty of Versailles, uh, nor did it join the League of Nations. 
The British wanted control of Palestine, so in order to prevent a little buffer right there in the Suez Canal, and in order to build a land bridge from Haifa, where they wanted to export oil, get the oil to, to England, and then to build pipelines all the way through Jordan, which has very little oil, into, of course, the oil-rich provinces that make up Iraq. Of course, they didn't give up this area until 1949, and even then, Great Britain built up the army in Jordan, the so-called Arab Legion, which had a British commander of the Arab Legion until 1958. It's why Jordan's one of the last countries in the Middle East to join the United Nations. The UN wouldn't admit them until they actually had a Jordanian commander running their army. Of course, at the end of World War I, Palestine did not become a Jewish homeland, and the British very soon began to regret that they had even come up with that idea. They also begin to regret the mandate, which they soon realize is going to be a thankless task, that there's going to be no way to hold on to this place, and that there's really going to be no way to understand and really work with the various peoples that live there. So what will Palestine become? This is an early postcard image of Tel Aviv, here spelled with two L's in Tel Aviv, to tell you how um, old this image is. Will it be an escape hatch from the terrors of Eastern Europe? No, but thousands of Jews are going to start to move there, mostly from Eastern Europe. They are, for the most part, Ashkenazi Jews coming from the East. The most famous example of this might be the famous Israeli writer who just died a couple of months ago, Amos Oz, whose family was from Vilnius in Lithuania, knew they had to get out of Lithuania. This is 1931, mind you tried at first to go to Germany, which they thought would be a better place to be than Vilnius, in 1931, which might tell you what a place Vilnius was, if your parents or grandparents came from there. That tells you how awful it must have been. Attempted to go to France, attempted to go to Britain, attempted to go to Canada, attempted to go to the United States, all of which said no. So Oz's family ended up in Palestine, a place that his parents hated. In fact, he attributes his mother's suicide to the fact that she couldn't adjust from life from urbane, urban, sophisticated Vilnius to a place like Tel Aviv, which was then a complete backwater. Now, the British, of course, are going to do everything that they can in the 1930s to limit the number of Jews who are coming to Palestine, both to keep it under control and so they don't have to dispatch soldiers to the Middle East at a time when the security of Europe is looking particularly bad. So in 1936, they issue something called the White Paper, which bans all, virtually all, Jewish migration into Palestine and bans Arabs from selling land to Jews on the hope that that would keep Jews from coming in. This document will keep Jews from migrating legally from Eastern Europe into Palestine. Uh, most Jewish leaders, most Zionist leaders, blamed this document as much as they blame anything else for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Jews who had no choice but to remain in Eastern Europe. As David Ben-Gurion said during the Second World War, we must fight the Second World War as if there were no white paper, and we must fight the white paper as if there were no Second World War. A very dangerous situation that Jews are in. And again, those exhibits around the corner will show you why the United States isn't an option in the 1920s, 1930s, or even the 1940s. Now you'll note, as I wrap this up, that I have barely mentioned Germany, and that's by design. The problems that Jews faced in Europe were not exclusively German, or even mostly German, in the years before 1933. As the Amos Oz example shows, there were plenty of Jews who, until the 1930s, thought that Germany was a better place to live than Poland, Czechoslovakia, Lithuania, even France, where a rise of anti-Semitism had begun, and the country that David Ben-Gurion believed was the most anti-Semitic in Europe prior to 1933, and a comment he made again after the Second World War. This helps to explain, I think, why the Nazis got so much help in places like Poland, Ukraine, France, and elsewhere during the Second World War. It is therefore appropriate that we study the Second World War. It is appropriate that we study the Nazi causes of the modern horrors of Jewish history. But we also need to place the roots of the problem at the end of the First World War in what George Kennan, the American diplomat, famously called the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century. That is true for Europe, but it is no less true for Europe's Jews. Thank you very much for your attention. Why did the uh, joint support for the, uh, you know, the Jews from Eastern Europe stop in 1917? Okay, um, for one reason, it's it's much more difficult for an American charity to send aid into a country that is now. The United States is not yet at war with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but the, the fear is that any aid that the United States, even private individuals, send 
to Jewish groups in Eastern Europe will end up in the hands of Austria-Hungary, which is at war with France and Britain, um, even though the United States didn't declare war on Austria-Hungary for a while. So th that's the fear. Um, some aid still does get there through Switzerland, through other neutral uh, parties, but it really is much more problematic once the United States gets involved in the war. Then the State Department's involved, all kinds of bureaucratic red tape gets involved. Why didn't the U.S. declare war on Turkey? Great question. And, and what effect did it have post-war? So I think the reason the United States gets involved in the First World War is that by the spring of 1917, it looks as though the years of American neutrality have made this country less safe, not more safe. And I don't want to go on to that. There's a book I did with, with Oxford that I, where I laid this out a lot more. I can, t I can talk about it a lot more. Let me leave it there. So what I think happens is the United States went to war in April 1917 to eliminate that threat. The threat is, in fact, coming from Germany. It's not coming from Austria, and it's not coming from the Ottoman Empire. So the American view is a declaration of war against those two countries not only distracts attention from the war we need to be fighting, it will get us involved in problems that we don't want to be involved in. So Wilson is careful. I, I tell my students who are army colonels that they all need to read Woodrow Wilson's Declaration of War speech because it is as American a document as you can possibly imagine. We're not going to war with Germany. We're going to war with their bad government. The problem comes after the war when the Americans start to say, well, look, we can't solve the problem of Germany if we don't solve Austria, and we can't solve the problems of Austria-Hungary if we don't solve the problem of the Ottoman Empire. So it is odd that the United States didn't declare war on the Ottomans at all, and here our people are having negotiations about what the future of the Middle East ought to look like. But we did pull back from those discussions and did not do, did not get as heavily involved in those discussions as we did Europe. The sudden increase in the worldwide anti-Semitism right now, not only in the United States, but especially in Western Europe, uh, it looks to me, and I hope I would be wrong, yeah. but it looks to me it's the litmus test of the World War III. What is your comment? So I do a lot of work in France. That's actually, I'm trained as a French historian. I'm in France more than I am any other place. Um, and the rise in anti-Semitism in France is deeply concerning. Um, I have French friends who are French academic friends, and they tend to lean politically left. And I have a lot of French army friends who tend to lean politically kind of center right. Um, and they both tell me the same thing, that they believe that the rise in anti-Semitism in France is not deep, and that France, unlike in past years, French society is rallying to defend French Jews rather than piling on. Um, I'm not sure where this is going. I'm an historian. We tend not to predict the future. But I agree with you. The signs are deeply troubling. Um, I am warmed by at least some governments, the German, the French, the Spanish, and the Italian, at least until this, I don't know what this recent government is doing, but until recently, the recent election, that have all taken deep measures, active measures, to try to address the problem. Uh, where it will go from here, I have no idea, but it is well worth all of us keeping our eyes on. I wish I had a better answer for you. I, I just don't. I'm as troubled by it as you are, and I have no answer. Thank you so much. I, um, I love the very short introductions, and I'm really looking forward to reading this. I'm not familiar with a lot of these things, so it's great to have an, an introduction to it. But the question I have is you've You've connected the major empires of uh, Austria-Hungary and German, multi-ethnic German and Ottoman and Russian. Is there some other or some way to understand what those particular kinds of, yeah, they're, they're historically, uh, they've existed for a very long time under a certain system, a particular kind of monarchy system were they allied is that an uh, were they actually in alliance as well no Those so uh, Germany Austria and the Ottoman Empire are in an alliance what they share in common I think what they share in common is a brittleness of political systems so that once the system breaks it can't adjust so France and Britain when one government breaks the prime minister falls another one comes up until they get it right these systems cannot do that and the other thing they all have in common is that they all are, they're all ruined by the end of the war. They don't just get a 
they, they just don't get changed by the war, they're destroyed by the war. So whereas France, Britain, um, I would argue the United States are affected by the war, these systems are destroyed by, they just don't exist anymore. And that's what they share in common. So what you have to do if you're in the majority, if you're Austrian, if you're in the kind of center of these countries, is you have to somehow explain the defeat. And of course, looking for external enemies is the easy, or internal enemies is the easiest way to do it. Well, they, they do look within, but um, you look for groups that are not core to the polity. So you like group socialists, Jews, agitators, any group that's not core to the inside. Um, so that's what they all share in common. Um, what I think they really share in common is the first point that I made. They're just too brittle to adapt to the, to the actual circumstances of war. And the Russian is the first one that just, it just breaks. It can't do this. Whereas the democracies are able to make those adjustments as they go. Hi. Hi. One thing that's interested me for a while, and I saw it, is the third item on one of your slides is Jewish involvement in communism. And in terms of the involvement of the Jewish community, how much did that have to do with the hatred toward the Jewish people and, and the intensity and complexity that arose afterwards when yeah. uh, people turned on us? So I think it had a lot to do with it, because it's easy then to connect one ethnic group, in this case the Jews, with an international political movement. Um, the other thing that is of course true is many Jews are attracted to left-wing movements because they're excluded from conservative movements. They're not allowed to participate for all these reasons that I articulated. Um, it's complicated, of course, because not all Jews were communists and not all communists were Jews, but the association is very easy to make. There were some very prominent Jews that were involved. Trotsky, we think of Rosa Luxemburg, Bella Kuhn, who ran Hungary's Communist Party until it was dissolved. Um, so, is it a, so I think it's a major part of what's happening to the anti-Semitism in the 1920s and 1930s. That's not a major part of the anti-Semitism pre-World War I. But what links them, and there's a new book, it was just reviewed in the New York Review of Books, if you're interested, called The Judeo-Bolshevik Myth, I think is the name of the book, that argues that, he argues, that what this is is a repackaging of old myths of the international Jews. So the same thing that they go after Dreyfus for, it's easy to transmute those stereotypes into communist stereotypes after the war. This is great. Good questions. Lots of questions. Did, um, did the disruption in civil population that you described in the East um, result from strategic decisions by the, the armies that were um, so involved this is, in that theater? So this is the real debate among scholars who really do this for a living. There are um, several books that have been written on German occupation policy in Poland one of which argues that yes, this is a dry run for the Holocaust, that they were already thinking the next time we do this, we just have to get rid of the people who live here. Um, there are counter arguments who say, look, they don't have any idea how to govern this place. So they're putting policies in place that they think will work, but the policies are destroying Jewish life because the policies are intended to help the army fight better. The policies are not intended to sustain Jewish life. Um, I could give you my opinion on that debate, but again, I'm not a specialist. I, I lean on the people that really know this material in, the, in those languages, in Polish and in Russian and in German. Um, the debate is over whether the, the, this is intentional or whether it's incidental. So the debate's very much open. Both books are really good on this topic, but they make very different arguments, as historians sometimes do. Uh, I wanted to uh, just let, let you know what the attitude of the German Jews the men were in Germany. They couldn't wait to enlist. I mean, uh, in World War One, huh? In, in the First World, World War. Of yeah, course, of course. World War of course. One. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, half my uncles, yeah. great uncles, were deaf of from the cannon. My grandfather died yeah. in uh, November twenty fifth, uh, uh, nineteen fifteen, right in the beginning of, of the yep. war in Belgium. Yep. They were so gung ho. They didn't. I, I figured out he probably was never drafted. So they, many many German Jews, of course, don't consider themselves to be. Jewish first, they consider themselves to be Germans first. So um, one of the things that happens in the First World War, there is this thing called the uh, Bergfrieden. The Kaiser comes out on the first day of the war, and he says, I recognize no more parties. I recognize no more minorities. I only recognize Germans. And German Jews respond to that as much as anybody else. So it's a question in European history and in Jewish history. Is my friend Rob, did he sneak in here? Rob, are you in here? Okay, I was hoping he would make it, but he didn't. He's an historian of Germany. One of the debates in Germany is you could really make the case that in 1915 to 1918, Germany's the least anti-Semitic of the major powers. Yet that's where the Holocaust is going to hit. So uh, 
course. I mean, we're talking about millions of people with millions of different viewpoints. Um, what I think the main point that historians would point out who do this is that German Jewish response is not different than German non Jewish response. Just as there were fellow Alsatians that didn't want to shoot another Alsatian, German Poles that didn't want to shoot another Pole, right? The difference comes after the war, not during, I think is the main point. I think two more questions. Where did the poison of that Central European pre-World War anti-Semitism sort of come from? There was Luiger and Schoener in Vienna. It, that was a political thing. Then there was the Catholic Church, which liked to sometimes uh, uh, fan the flames. Then there was the racism from the University of Graz. Yeah. It all kind of came together. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not a specialist in, in the history of European anti-Semitism. Um, what I think the First World War changes, which I can speak to, is again this shift from imperial identity to national. So um, historians refer to this um, by all kinds of different, different uh, names, but they talk about eliminationist anti-Semitism developing after the First World War. That is, the idea goes from being after the First World War, the idea being that Jews are different, Jews are weird, you should keep them in their own ghettos, you should keep them in their shtetls, to the idea that this place would really be better if they were just gone. And what's different is that, as you're, again, as you're creating these new nation states, if you're gonna create a Poland, well, the identifying markers of what a Pole is, Jews simply don't match. Now, when you're doing this in a big, diverse, multi-ethnic empire, there's still anti-Semitism, there's still problems, there's still all kinds of issues, but you're one among a number of minorities. When you begin to shift to a national identity, that's when the problems really start to come in. Uh, you pointed out uh, that the Ottomans uh, removed a bunch of Jews from what is now Palestine. Uh, where did they send them? They did the same thing in broad outline to what they did with the Armenians. The notion was you had to get them away from the coast. You had to get them away from the coastal cities because if the British did an amphibious landing, in, on the Mediterranean coast, you don't want this Jewish population to be there to help them. So they pushed them inland into the cities that are inland and up into Galilee. And they didn't keep records, uh, so we don't know exact figures, but we think about one third of Palestine's population did not go back to their pre-war cities. Now what we don't know is frankly what happened to most of them. Uh, but the idea was, just like with the Armenians, they were afraid that the Armenians would support the Russians in the Caucasus. They were afraid that the Jews would support the British on the coastline, specifically because of British Zionism and the beginning of the Balfour Declaration. It's a subject we just don't have a lot of information about. What archives there are will be in Turkey, which is largely closed, especially on an issue like this one, because they're so sensitive about Armenia. They would be in Turkish, of course, and they would be in the old Turkish script, which not a lot of people can read. So. I have huge admiration for my friends who study Ottoman Turkey. It is impossibly difficult to do. The only other country I think that's probably harder to work in is Russia. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Michael will be signing books, and there is a small reception in the Great Hall. Thank